Hello, welcome back to Retro Break and welcome to my 500th video. I can't believe I've done 500 videos already, that's just insane. So to celebrate the occasion, I thought I would take some time out of doing my usual videos to show you guys everything that goes on behind the scenes. There's so much to cover in this video, including scripting, recording, editing, uploading and everything else in between. I hope you all find it really interesting, let's get started. So before I can start filming any games or recording anything, I need to have an idea of what the video is going to be about. So the first thing I do for each episode is add on to this list that I've got here on my notes app, add on some ideas for the episode and just some general points that I want to talk about. So for the one that I'm going to be filming in this video, it's about my Super Mario Brothers memories of all the console games. So the first thing I do is get a list of all the games and then go and pick them all out of my game collection. So I'm going to start by making a new note and I'll kind of put the loose idea of what the title of the video is going to be and then a few bullet points here so the best thing to do is probably to go on to for this one probably onto the Mario wiki or something and get a list of all the console games. And I suppose the good thing about doing it this way is the fact that I also get all the release dates for the games as well. Okay, there we go. So I've got a list of all the games. Now the next thing to do is go and pick all the games out of my game collection. So Mario 1, 2 and 3 should be down here somewhere in this box of NES games. And maybe Mario 1's in the NES itself because I couldn't find it in this box. I don't exactly have a lot of space in this room so most of the consoles are actually down here under the desk. I think the NES is there. And it does have Mario inside. There we go. So we've got all the three Mario games. Hopefully I'm going to get a new house soon and then all these will be presented nicely. But for now, this is what I've got to deal with. And as you can see, again, not much space. Here's my desk. So to actually plug the systems in, I have to move the mouse and keyboard and stuff out of the way. There we go. And now to get the wires. I actually have a box of AV cables right here. So I'll pull out the NES ones and find the plug somewhere as well and then get all this hooked up. There we go. Pretend you didn't see all them drink cans there, they just magically disappeared. So luckily, I already have the SNES plugged in, so I can take the power cable out there. There we go. And the NES, actually, you can get AV by using these ports on the side. So I needed a double-ended... There we go. There's a double-ended one. And because the NES is only in mono, you actually only need these ones. There we go. I've never done a video like this before either, so I do apologise if it's a complete disaster. So I want to plug these in here. Plug the other end into one of these SCART adapters because my TV hasn't got the ports for these. So usually yellow is video and then white and red are audio, but as the NES only has two, one of them has to carry the video signal, but I'm not sure which one it is. But anyway, that's plugged in down there. On the floor there I've got a power strip and that powers these two TVs over here. So the next thing to do is to plug the NES in. If you can see that under the computer, I've got this SCART extension cable. So this end here, this bit is what you need to record with. So I'll plug the NES into that. And then this is actually a SCART splitter. So half of that goes into the computer and the other half, if I plug it in, should go into that TV over there. It looks like it's the white one that carries the picture. Yeah, there we go. We have signal, so we've got the game running on there. Yep, looks good. So now the next thing is to get it to the computer. So I have another TV screen here, and this one's going to show what the computer's picking up. How do I explain this? So for some consoles that have RGB support, I've got here the OSSC, but as the NES doesn't, I need to take the other end of the SCART cable out of there and put it into this SCART to HDMI converter. So put that in there and then on this on this HDMI splitter that I've got here if I go on channel 1 and set the capture software to HDMI it should pick up that something's there and it says no signal at the minute but that's because I was going from HDMI before so I need to press the SCART button on here twice there we go so now we have Mario running on the CRT which I'm going to be playing on just because I prefer playing on CRTs and capture in there which will make a video file on the computer. So the next thing that I'm going to do 
if I zoom in on the computer screen, hopefully you can see that, is go to my uh, 2020 folder. There we go. So I've got everything organized here by month. So if I go into May, because that's the month we're in now, make a new folder in there, call it Mario Memories. And then inside that, if I call this SMB1, then that's where I want to save the video file. So go and browse, find that location. So May, Mario Memories, SMB1, open. And then I need to go on audio encoder, change that to MP4, change recording to disk true, press record. It should, in a second, pop up in VLC on the computer. There it is. And I want to mute that because it will have the sound coming out of three things at once then. So that's what the computer can see. And then I'm going to play the game for about five or ten minutes to capture footage and then do this for the other NES games. And then I'll come back on this video to tell you what I do next. And you can actually see how much of a delay there is on the capture software. Yeah, there you go. There's one of the troubles I run into. Occasionally the program just stops working for no apparent reason and that just spins around endlessly. So yeah, that's completely dead. So I have to come out of it, force quit, and then try and wait for it to load back up again. So I'm not going to sugarcoat this episode. This is genuinely what it's like behind the scenes for me making videos. So now I have to go through and set all this up again. Audio encoder, yes. Go to VLC choose the folder again and if I forget to choose the folder then they all just go into the movies folder and get mixed up so I have to go back through and click back into May, uh, Mario Memories and then this one is Super Mario 2 press open and sometimes if it crashes there'll be like a file in there already so I'll need to go and delete that and then it should be ready to go so press record cross my fingers and hope for the best okay there we go now back to gaming So one other thing is that while I'm playing the games I also have the notepad open on the screen so I can take any notes of any things that I want to say during the episode. So I've just been playing Mario 3 here and I've had a few ideas of what I want to say during the episode so I'm going to write them down on here. Another thing that I need to remember to do after recording a game is check that all the files have come through properly. There should be an mp4 file which is what I used to add into Final Cut and an mt2s file which I will delete later on. That's the one that the capture card creates as standard. So you can see there I'm just checking through the file to make sure it all looks good and then I'll go ahead and rename it to mario1.mp4 and then delete the other two files because I don't need them for what I'm using them for. And then the next thing to do after that is set up more folders within this Mario Memories bit for all of the other games I'm going to record and make sure that all of the files go into these new locations as I'm going. Okay so that's the NES games recorded so now I can unplug this plug the SNES back in and then play the next two games in the series. The SNES is a really easy one to set up, it uses the same plug as the NES and this is already plugged in right next to it so I just need to reconnect it to this. My SNES games are in this box right here. There was one thing I forgot to mention about the SNES and that's the fact that I've got this one hooked up using S-Video to this monitor down here so I have to unplug this TV and plug this one in but we can still do the same thing and capture footage to the computer using that Sony PVM monitor instead. So now we're going to play some Super Mario World. And you can see it's come up over there as well. But obviously this screen is a lot clearer. I don't know how well the camera can pick this up, but if I zoom in on that, you might be able to make out how nice it looks. And I'm actually playing this in 50Hz, but there is a switch on the back of the SNES to put it into 60 but Mario World seems to have some trouble being in 60, so if I switch it back to 50, and for this video I'm going to keep using 50 hertz because that's what I actually played the games in in the first place. And of course there it is on the flat screen, if I can try and angle the camera there. So you can see it's not as clear as playing it on the CRT. But that's the best I can do at the minute in terms of capturing footage, so I do what I can. And I've got a few settings in Final Cut, which I'll show you a bit later on, how I get the quality back to something more similar to 
playing it on there instead. But for now, let's play some Mario World and some Super Mario All Stars. It was getting late, so I decided to record the rest of the games on the next day. And it's now the weekend, so I didn't have to wait until after work either. And I went ahead and recorded the rest of the SNES games and the N64 as well, and that's plugged in exactly the same way as the SNES is. I did, however, have a few problems recording the GameCube, and I'll talk you through how I managed to solve those issues now. Now, next up is the GameCube. As you can see on the CRT, it looks perfectly fine, but if you have a look on the capture, it doesn't look very good at all. It's actually duplicating part of the picture. Yeah, so you can kind of see here at the end where it's like duplicating the image. So what I do, instead of putting it straight into here, if I take the SCART cable, and because the cable that's coming out of the GameCube is an R RGB one, I can actually put it into the OSSC, turn that on, press the button to connect it, and then take the HDMI cable from that, put that into this, change this into HDMI mode, and then if you look back up here, and there you go, that's fixed it. So now you can see it's not duplicated at all, it looks a lot better. But of course it still looks better for me playing it on there. So I play it on there and use the OSSC to capture the actual gameplay. As for capturing the games on the Wii, Wii U and Switch, that's really simple because they can all just use HDMI, which just goes straight into the capture card. Now once all the games have been recorded, the next thing I need to do is, to be honest, a little bit boring, but it's something that's really important, else you'll get very confused later on, and that is to go through all of the output files and rename them all so that it makes sense when you actually import all the files into Final Cut. And for this video in particular, there was just one other thing that I needed to record that I haven't actually done before, and that's record a DVD. I was hoping it would be really straightforward, and that I'd just be able to capture it off the screen on the computer, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. As you can see, it's come up on the screen, hopefully you can see that. So what I'm going to do to be able to record the screen using the keyboard for the Mac, hopefully you can see that I hold Command, Shift and 5. And then that will let me start recording the screen, so if I press record at the bottom. And apparently it doesn't like recording DVDs. There must be some sort of copyright protection. So instead I'll try using OBS and see if that works. So you go on display capture, keep it as that, and then basically that captures the entire screen. So you can press start recording, and hopefully the DVD will reset itself. Whatever the Mac uses to play DVDs has some very clever copy protection, because as soon as I open OBS and then go back to the DVD it just comes up with a grey screen as soon as I close it and go back over, it shows up again. And I didn't have any systems hooked up that could play DVDs, so in the end I decided just to point the camera at the screen and then try and colour correct it afterwards to kind of match the quality of the original DVD. To play Super Mario Galaxy 2, you'll need a Wii remote. Don't worry, I won't torture you guys by making you watch that DVD any longer. Instead, I'll show you a little bit of behind the scenes footage as to how I recorded that section and showed off the cover for the DVD there, as well as the booklet which came with the Mario All-Stars collection for the Wii, which I think is a really cool addition to that bundle. And as well as recording the booklet, I also did a very quick overview of each of the games in the series as well, as you can see here. Now the next thing to do is make some room on these shelves and get all the games laid out nicely. Now that the background's all set, the next thing is to prepare the camera. So first I have to unfold the tripod like this and get everything set up. So I'm just going to talk you through briefly all of the different settings that I use while I'm filming. So for some more behind the scenes stuff, I thought it might be interesting to tell you guys what the settings are that I've got on my camera. So if we have a look at the front here, hopefully you can see, it is really awkward having this light on here, but it's the only way I could figure out how to get the light working. So, so you can see there I've got the shutter speed set to 1 over 50, and that's because I've got the frame rate of the camera set to 25 FPS because, well, there's a good reason for that. And that is because a lot of the games that I record are PAL games. So if we go into the settings of the camera, as you can see, I've got the focus mode on manual. I have white balance on there set to daylight. 
D-Range Optimizer on that gives the shadows a bit more detail. Creative Style and Portrait, just because I think that looks better. And then if we go across to number two, it's on Manual Exposure, because I'll set that and I'll show you that in a minute. It's in 4K XAVCS, which is the highest quality file that you can get out of this. And then for the recording settings, I've got that on 25p 100m, which is the highest setting you can do for that as well. If you change the file format down to HD, you've got some other options. So sometimes I use these if I want to capture the higher frame rates. And then if I capture any games that are NTSC, then I'll change that to 60 frames a second and then change it to 30 instead of 25 at 4K. But for the frame rates that I'm working with, that's the best setting that I've, that I've found so far. And then basically I've got it set for focus peaking. So that means that when I turn the focus dial, you can see that these yellow lines appear and that just tells you what's in focus on the frame. So generally if I'm stood by the shelf, I want to have most of the shelf sort of slightly highlighted yellow like that. And then it should highlight me in yellow, which means that I'm in focus. So there was a quick overview of how I use the camera settings. And then obviously to get the screen facing forward, I have to tilt it down like that, flip the screen up and then move the microphone to behind the screen and then fold it all back again and then line up the uh, light like that. And the microphone I've got here is the Rode video mic. And that just goes onto this frame here and connects into the side of the camera down there. And it does have one of these for when I'm recording outside. So I'll put this on to stop the uh, wind noise. But I don't really need that while it's inside. So that's so that's the setup that I've got for the camera. I used to use this Blue Yeti mic, but it's kind of awkward to get that synced up with the camera. So it's a lot better having the microphone on the camera itself. And then I just use this one for when I'm actually doing voiceover after I've already filmed everything. Three, two, one. Hello, welcome back to Retro Break and welcome to my video on the Mario series. I've wanted to do this video for a long time. It's a series that means a lot to me. And ending with the switch. And, um... So I think I just made a good point there and that's the fact that if you don't properly plan a video beforehand, if you just go and shoot it before you truly know what you want the video to be about and what you want to say, it's just not going to work. You can cut the video up as much as you want, but it just won't feel right. So I've gone back to the drawing board and I've started writing a more detailed script. So like I said, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. This is exactly how it is for me. So back to the drawing board, back to square one, and I'm going to come back to it maybe tomorrow and try and re-record it. And hopefully I'll feel a lot better about it. So here we are the day after with the take two, and this time I managed to flesh the script out properly and I've got it there on the screen. So when I'm stood in front of the camera, I can actually look over and read what I was actually about to say, rather than trying to come up with it on the spot. Hello, welcome back to Retro Break. In today's video to celebrate Mario's 35th anniversary, I thought I'd take the time now to talk through the entire of the console series. So that's why Mario 3 is one of my favorite games out of the entire series. And it's definitely a game you should go and play if you haven't already. There we go, so I finished recording. Now I'll take the SD card out. If I can get to it, this is one of the most awkward SD cards in any camera that I've had so far. Look at that. That's just stupid. It does come out though with a bit of wiggling. I don't know why they thought it was a good idea to put it that close to the inside of the camera if the camera is going to be attached to a tripod. But there we go. Got the SD card. And then this is a bit awkward as well. I have to turn the screen round. Yep. And then the next thing to do before I get any B-roll is actually transfer these files off the camera. So they will be in here. If we scroll down to the bottom, it'll be this one. Give it a quick look, see if it looks okay. That's good, and I was in focus. I was a bit worried that I was out of focus because it's kind of hard to see. Oh no, the second bit's a bit out of focus, but it looks all right. I got some essential editing supplies, a nice big bag of toffee popcorn, and a nice strong coffee as well. So for the next few hours, I'm gonna be editing the video. So I'm gonna try and capture everything that I'm doing during the edit and talk you guys through why I'm doing it and how as well. 
So what I'm doing here is taking that video file off the camera and copying it into the folder that I set up earlier on the computer. Then once all the video files are complete, the next thing to do is open up Final Cut Pro and set up a new project library. And then once the library is set up, I import all of the media. So as you can see there, I've highlighted the whole lot and I import that all into the project. Then after that, the next thing to do is actually set the project up. So if you click on the new project button at the bottom and give it a title, and for this one I'm doing it in 4K60, but for some where I just cover the older games I do 4K50 instead. So choose the frame rate that's right for your video, and then drag in the main video file. So Final Cut works in a slightly different way to a lot of other video editing programs, in the fact that this one's a magnetic timeline. So you actually want the main video clip to go on the timeline first, and then you add things to the top and the bottom of it, and then you can cut it up, and everything else moves with it as well. I think it's a really good system, and it's really easy to use. I really enjoy it. And I also have a template for showing off the 4x3 aspect ratio games, and I've got that saved in a different library on the side. So I go in there and copy over that template into the project library, and then I can use that when I want to add gameplay clips. And the other thing that I want to do for this template is to find box art for all of the games as well. So, so a quick Google Images search and I've found the box art for all the games. So I drag all of those into the library and then I can do what I'm doing now, which is to add that to the template, resize it and put a shadow on the image. And I go through and do that for each of the games. So now the template's been set up with the title of the game, the year it was released, and a nice picture of the box art, the next thing to do is to find the video file from the actual gameplay and drag that underneath the template so that it fills in the gap in the screen there. So I'm scrubbing across the video file here to find a good bit of gameplay, and then I'll stretch that out to fill the gap there. And then I have a preset filter which I downloaded from GameSack's website that gives it a really nice scanline option and that's what I mentioned earlier about getting the games to look as close as possible to how they look on the CRT. So as you can see there I'm choosing that built-in template, double click on it and it comes up with a load of options so you can tweak it if it doesn't look quite right. And then the next thing to do because the capture card actually records all the games in widescreen is to reduce the scale in the X and Y axis so that it fills this box and I've actually set up the template so that the box there is exactly a 4x3 aspect ratio so if I adjust it to fit in there it should look right and then I can apply the scan lines so they're quite subtle but it does make the games pop a little bit more and it makes them look a little bit more authentic I feel as well so there's the finished product for that one I think it looks really good so I go through and do that for all the different games. There was quite a lot to do for this video, so it did take a while. It makes the videos feel a little bit more professional and I'm quite happy with the result. Of course, in the future, I'll probably go back and make this template look even better, but that's what I'm using for now and I'm quite happy with how it looks. There's one other image that I also add into the start of every video and that's my Retro Break logo. So I drag that in from my Movies folder and resize it to move it into the corner of the screen. Depending on where I'm standing, it's either on the left or the right there, and I put on a little bit of a dissolve so that it fades naturally into the video after a few seconds. And then after that, it's basically a case of watching back everything that I said and cutting the video up to remove any awkward pauses or any duplicated scenes where I did several takes to try and find out what was the best one. So I'll play the rest of this editing in fast forward just so you can get an idea of just how much goes into it behind the scenes and the recording here for the screen was about three hours long so that gives you kind of an idea of how long it takes to make a first draft of this sort of thing and then usually I'll go back to it the day after with a fresh mind watch it all the way through and then cut it up even more to make it a little bit easier to watch because the first time isn't always the best so it's good to go back with a fresh mind and then watch it kind of from the point of view of someone else watching it rather than yourself so I always try and think about the viewer and think about how they want to spend their time. So sometimes I actually end up cutting out quite a lot of the video just because I feel it would kind of ruin the flow of it. So overall, I think it took me about six hours to edit this one, which is quite good considering the length. I think the final video came out to about 20 minutes long. So I'm pretty happy with that. And for this part of the video, I wanted to get a video off YouTube of the original reveal of Super Mario Sunshine. And I found a really easy way of getting videos off YouTube to be able to download them. And that is literally just to go to the URL and type in PP after YouTube. So it's YouTube 
pp and then whatever the normal URL is. And that sends you to a special site where you can actually download either an MP3 or an MP4 of that video. And it's been really useful for me so far. So fingers crossed that service stays around because it's really good. And then once all the video is edited and once I've got all the gameplay and stuff in there, the next thing to do is find some background music. And because this one was based on the Mario series, I wanted each part of the video to have the theme tune from that particular Mario game. So there's a few good websites I know where I can get MP3 files and lined that up on the timeline with the matching game clip. So I went on there and downloaded the first stage theme tune for each game in the Mario series. And then when it cuts to the gameplay, I like to fade the music out and then fade the gameplay back in and, they, and then fade back into the music afterwards. So that also takes quite a while to do, but it's definitely worth it. And then the last thing you'll want to do before the video is finished is to, is to check that all the audio levels are right. So for that, I always set the audio on the computer to three bars. And that's just so that I know that every video is edited in the same way. So hopefully doing it that way makes the audio sound quite consistent amongst all my other videos. And I think the final result worked quite well. There's always a few bits that I feel like I could do better, but I usually take notes at the end of it and put all those lessons learnt into the next video going forwards. And of course, if you haven't seen the final product, that was last week's video on my channel, so I'll put a link in the description so you can go and watch that. But now that the video is finished being edited, the next thing that I need to do is upload it to YouTube. So let's take a look at how I do that. So it's currently 20 past 8 on Wednesday night, and I've just finished editing my Super Mario video. So now I'm going to give it one last watch all the way through and see if there's any little bits that need fixing. And then I'll be exporting the video, uploading it to Patreon, and then if there's any other problems, fingers crossed someone on Patreon will pick that up before Friday. And while I'm doing that, I'll also start making the thumbnail in Photoshop as well. So exporting the video, while really simple, can take a good few hours depending on how long the video is and whether it's in 4K or not. So you create the master file here and give it a title. And then if you go into the settings, there's a few things you need to change on here. So set it to web hosting, put it in better quality, and then make sure the resolution's as high as it can go. And I have made the mistake before of not changing the resolution and uploading it and finding out that it was only set to 480p. So definitely make sure you do that. And then you have to sit and watch this screen here for a few hours. And because that's so processor intensive and my computer's quite old, I can't do anything while it's doing that. So I just have to leave it in the background. And then when the file's finally finished, I go onto YouTube, select the file here, and then upload it. Unfortunately, these days I have to use YouTube's new uploading system, which is really clunky, and I'll go into a few details as to why right now. So you can see I've selected the file there, and it's asking me to put in the title, so I just change it very slightly and put in the title of the file. Usually for the description, I'll take whatever notes I'd written in my notes app, and paste that in there and then format it so that it reads a bit better. So it's always good having the notes because then you've basically got the description written already for you. So you don't have to write a separate one for that. And I found out that if you put a hashtag in the description it will actually let you click on that and see other videos with the same hashtag. Kind of like how they work on Twitter. So that's a really nice addition that they've done. On this next screen here, you just select them to turn monetization on. For some reason, they've got a button there to select if you want adverts after the video, but I've never actually been able to click it until after the video is already live. And the same with this next screen here. It's asking me to do the ending video sequences, but it won't actually let you do that until you've already come off this screen. So I have no idea why it's on this screen in particular. The screen space for this uploading section is incredibly small. So you have to keep scrolling even though there's loads of space left on the screen. A lot of things YouTube's done recently with this uploading system don't make any sense to me at all. So once I've gone through all that and got it set to upload, I can finally get round to making the thumbnail. Of course, I've got a template set up in Photoshop here, complete with some titles and my character drawing there as well. So for this one, I just took a photo of the shelves and now I'm just editing it together to make it look nice and make it look kind of eye-catching. I've still got a long way to go with making the thumbnails look really good, but I think I did all right with this one. Now, once the thumbnail's complete, go back onto YouTube and add it as a thumbnail for the video, and then write some tags underneath. And that just helps the video show up in search and recommended videos on the side of other ones. And that's it, it's finally ready to go live. So I upload it first to Patreon, and then the next day in the morning, I'll make the video live using my phone and the YouTube Creator Studio app. And then once the video's changed to public on YouTube, I'll get the URL and write a tweet along with the thumbnail of the video to go alongside it and pin that to my profile. 
and then that's it. Then I just sit back, wait for the comments to come in, see what was good and what was bad about the video, and then start working on the next one. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope it's been really interesting for you. Let me know if you're starting a YouTube channel and you need any tips or advice, I'll be more than happy to help. So thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next week for another video. Goodbye.